Hello everyone, I'm High Treason, and yeah, there's been a bit of a delay, but it's not technical problems or anything. We've had some, uh, the K5's motherboards fail. My single Pentium 3 seems to be failing now as well, but I've, I've fixed the K5, I'm working on the Pentium 3. Th that aside, yeah, I wanted to review Dark Forces. I've been practicing it, but I've been too busy catching up my other channel and moving this room around. I mean, look at this room now. Fuck yeah, it's miles better. Uh, it's probably a good thing I live on my own. Um, yeah, anyway, that aside. Um, yeah, this video system overview, obviously. Um, and I had a rather lang ramble at the front of it. But I've, I've got, I'm going to go off script and I'm going to truncate it. And shrink it down a little bit. So here goes. My MD Duron failed for the last time, all them years ago. And I built an Athlon 64. And uh, you know what? Not very professional of me. But this is my Athlon 64, what's left of it. Um, I can't find any record of that processor existing. I had that ahead of that processor actually coming out. Um, not by very long, but just enough. And according to the bloke who saw me, it's a sample. Uh, it won't work in other motherboards. It will only work in this one. It identifies as Hammer. And this thing killed its RAM every week or two. So it's not really very good. It says uh, 999 dim on it there. It's upside down, is it? Can't tell from here. So yeah, uh, that probably refers to the fact you'll have to dial that number to get the fire brigade uh, pretty damn soon. So, I was left with a choice. Uh, I spent a four-figure number on that thing, and it managed one video in its whole lifetime. And this is that video. This is the first time I've shown my old animated series in public, and it shows that when you have to work quick, you don't work well. You really don't. Um, I mean, look at what I'd done on the Duron before with the same series. I mean, bloody hell. There's no point in me showing you the whole series. You wouldn't understand it. it was an inside jerk for school, and it meant I got out of some of the assignments, my video editing course. But I needed a computer for this, and I was working at KCL. I needed one for that. Um, and, you know, also, I was... I was starting college and it said I required a computer for my coursework so I had to build one and what can I do? Do I scrap my 64, this several thousand pounds worth of gear? Do I keep repairing the RAM? My well, Pentium 3's RAM failed, can't use that. My 386 server died, power supply went, took everything with it. What am I going to do now? Everything else in storage. That Pentium 2 you saw next to the Athlon 64, that's gone in storage. I've got an Athlon 64 now, I want that shit, get out of here. So, what am I going to do now? You know, I figured a few options. Option I went with, scrap the thing, build a new machine. But that means I now have to build a computer with no money. I've got no money left. I couldn't afford to replace the RAM. What am I supposed to do now? Sell a few things. Sell some of the Duron that still works. Sell some of, like, the 386 that still worked. And sell my AMD machines. I had an Athlon XP2400 that was working. I just sold it get rid of that fucking well it required a bit of whack but I really regretted doing those but I was bitter towards AMD at the time so yeah, I had to build this thing and yeah okay well this thing's a piece of shit in my Athlon 2600 video yes I'm still butthurt over that thing I avoided saying it was the worst computer I'd ever owned in fact I think my words were that it was the worst AMD K7 I'd ever owned or something to that effect I decided, instead of the aforementioned long video, that I would make a shorter video on the worst AMD system I ever owned, in the hopes that it might help people understand why I'm not really that quick to buy any of their things. See? I did say that. Well, I considered this the worst machine I've ever owned. That might stay in the past tense now, though. However, I've never begrudged this machine for lack of performance or reliability. Determined to spend no money at all, I would have to piece together a machine with very little resources or money. I knew the more I spent on that, the longer it would take to get a new machine. I rummaged in my boxes and found two 33 MHz 486 processors, an appropriate motherboard for which I can't find documentation, though it appears some other people own them. Most parts in this machine came from the garbage. 
Some were bought very cheaply, often as defective parts. This graphics card is probably the best one. It's a really strange card featuring two Seng ET4000 chips, a 44-pin connector and fuses. I bought it from a man for as much as three cigarettes. The 500 megabyte quantum hard drive I wasn't so lucky with. That cost me almost a whole box of Richmond Super King's mental. I started smoking rolls, drum tobacco, around this time. But Sound Blaster 16 that keeps popping up in these started here. What I did was write it off as broken at work, wait for everyone to go home and lift it out of the bin. There was some freaky hard drive that could run as one large drive or two smaller ones that I wanted. I can't remember the brand, it ended in something like Cropolis, like Acropolis or Necropolis maybe. And it made loads of noise. Looking back, I should have made more effort to steal that. That way I could have had my cigarettes. This motherboard takes EDO and 30 pin SIM memory, but only that one slot appears to work. There's an 8 megabyte module of the cheapest, shittiest looking EDO RAM I've ever seen installed. The motherboard seems to dislike larger modules, but this generally enough for a 486 in this class. The battery was rotten, and this fix is recent. This meant I wouldn't turn the machine off if I could help it. Unfortunately, it froze in post if you had to restart, but I knew it would work after 10 seconds of no power, and it took about 12 seconds for the CMOS RAM to lose all of its settings. There are no filter capacitors in the power supply. They blew up a long time ago. It was a 200 watt supply, but I seriously doubt it provides 200 watts by this point. There's a Sound Blaster Vibra 16 in here now. The machine might inherit a Sound Blaster 2.0 if it behaves well enough. That CD-ROM drive doesn't work properly. That could be due to the drive controller, which is a VLB card. I used to run the hard drive and floppy from this one, and used this cheap one for the CD-ROM, only in the hopes that the machine would perform better. It makes no difference, it's still slow. ISA tends to share the entire bus between every card that's installed on it, so really there was no chance it was ever going to improve it. At some point it borrowed the Pentium 3's DVD rewriter. That's right, I actually did DVD authoring on this thing. Whoever invented buffer underrun protection is a fucking genius. Man, I would seriously shake your hand. That is a DE204 Ethernet card. It only works when it wants to. But it means I own something made by DEC, or Digital Equipment Corp. Check out Triple I and what they did with the PDP-11 if you want to know why that's significant to me. This cache totals 256 kilobytes, although it was not in use. As the motherboard does not document the jumpers, I didn't put any on. Turns out doing this and then enabling L2 cache in the BIOS makes the system a little bit unstable. I wish I knew that all that time ago. Luckily it doesn't appear to have damaged anything. Unfortunately I can only use 128 kilobytes as no combination of the jumpers seems to enable all of it. I have the same problem with a 386 motherboard, but at least it's real cache, not like those PC chips motherboards. This is probably one of the most interesting things, the CPU. This was the second one I found when building it. The pins were bent and out of laziness and a small wave of fanboyism I used the Intel one instead. This UMC one, a U5S Super 33, is what the board originally had as far as I am aware. A lot of companies made processors back then. This likely contributed to the rapid acceleration in advancements in that field. This CPU does not have a floating point unit or an L1 cache. Outside of CAD, there are very few MS-DOS programs which make use of a flowing point unit though, and don't tell me I'm missing a heatsink. It does not need one. I shall pit these two processors against each other shortly. I ran Windows Chicago for reasons I don't know. I was probably stunned. You lead Video Studio, and I seem to remember Sonic Foundry Video Factory worked in this after some coaxing. It did what I needed it to do, I suppose but I had to reinstall it to make it work for this video, so most of what I'd set up is now gone, sadly. 
For some reason, possibly an IRQ conflict, using the CD-ROM drive used to prevent the mouse and keyboard from operating, but not if you played a music CD, presumably because you're only accessing the drive for its index and then seeking to the track position. The rest is done by the drive itself. Hell, my first CD player was a CD drive hooked up to the back of my stereo. You could play or skip forward. That was it. Yeah, no IDE controller is needed for this to work. Actually, I think it's quite a well-known exploit. I had access to only a single CD at that time. This was the Eminem show. I missed my chabby MP3s from my workstation. Oh, and I still think I know every word on this damn CD. Towards the end, I did find some other Eminem CDs and a copy of Now 60, so it wasn't a total disaster. What an idiot I was to sell my Megadeth albums because they weren't cool, and I'm ashamed of myself. But I think I've rectified my problems since, and secretly I still always liked rock and metal better than rap and dance music anyway. The fact my favourite song on the Eminem disc samples an Aerosmith song. Probably shows that in my heart I still wanted to rock out. I thank Eve 6. I thought I'd got rid of that disc too, but when I found it, despite the fact they sound like a college band, they made me realise that I missed the sound of electric guitars. From there I moved on to Diesel Boy, having found that too, before looking up Slipknot and Megadeth on the internet, as realisation sunk in completely and totally. Anyway, listening to only one genre is narrow-minded. My rule now is that if I like a song, I'll listen to it, and I don't give a fuck whether you like it or not. As it's common with my machines, I created a boot menu. The only interesting thing to note is the Windows version at the top. Some of you may have never seen that before. What this operating system became was Windows 95. This is Build 73. Let's have a look at what's going on in there. For reference sake, I believe the first build of Windows 95 that you could get off the shelf was Build 950. It's entirely possible that you notice the three buttons where the start menu would be. Keep in mind that no Windows version before had such a button. The one with the Windows icon resembles the start menu in function and it allows you to do basic stuff like shut the machine down. The I button appears to react to which programs are open, allowing hot switching. When this was first implemented, the taskbar didn't exist in this way at least, so it made more sense. You can see in build 58 that there is a box here. You can drop things into it a bit like the quick launch bar or pin to taskbar in more modern operating systems. All the open programs stacked up above this as they still do in this build. This resembles program manager in Windows 3.1. The menu though was useful if you had a lot of programs running. It resembled the grouping in Windows XP in that it was tidy and it helped to deal with cluttered taskbars, although unlike XP it didn't minimise that clutter. Lastly, the help button gives you help. It appears it'll provide help relevant to the currently in focus window as well sometimes. One thing that is interesting is that you can detach the taskbar and leave it in the middle of the desktop. You can even resize it from this point on. The My Computer icon resembles the low colour one, not seen again until Windows 7. It is not present in Windows 95 through XP. Of course the design differs a lot here too. If I enable toolbars and status bars you can see where changes were made. Playing with drives and networks is very dangerous and it's likely to break the whole operating system, requiring tedious editing of the win -ini and system -ini, if not a complete reinstall of the operating system. System properties and its device manager are peculiar. The device manager resembles the arrange by connection view, but at the same time it has its own unique twist. I like the virtual memory thing. I wonder if the image was meant to have a graphic showing how much memory was in use, perhaps similar to the hard drive properties window in Windows 95 onwards. There are a whole host of accessories and things in this operating system, but there's so much to see I've often considered giving the operating system its own video. This may or may not happen at a later time. 
If I show you PZ check, everything checks out. It can't see my L2 cache, which seems to be an emerging pattern with this program. If I de-turbo, things become interesting. The BIOS has quite a few options to play with regarding the turbo. I can actually make the CPU run at around 2 MHz, possibly making it slower than the 6 MHz underclock 286 I have. It also disables the cache. It passes the turbo test too, but we already kind of knew it was working. The terminal velocity benchmark proved useful last time, so even though the game is a bit out of this machine's league, here it is running on the UM486. Now let's install the Intel 486. Remember, these both operate at the same clock rate, but the Intel one has an L1 cache and floating point unit, which should give it an advantage in theory. We're not even adjusting any jumper settings on the motherboard. The same test running on that processor yields an unexpected result. The UMC processor seems to be just a little bit faster. This trend is replicated through most programs as well, which I did not expect. Here they are running side by side. Demo-wise, this machine hits its limit around 1994, though surprisingly I've not had any compatibility issues with the processor. I was expecting infinite loops and divide by zeros galore. I have a horrible feeling something's very, very wrong. Is it cruel of me to run into the shadows on here? This is what I like with old machines. It'll at least try to run a program, even if it doesn't like it. Game-wise, it ends with Doom. By the time you get to games like Duke Nukem 3D, you're finished. It simply isn't playable. Is this still the worst machine I own? Well, no, it isn't. Nothing in here's broken down, really, and given four hours working IDE cables, Brasso, solder, and a photo of somebody else's motherboard to figure out the cash jumpers, it has turned into a relatively stable machine. Its performance is still pretty lacking, I'd say slower than most 33 MHz 486 systems, but the fact is it's been punished by a lack of time, money, and at the time I built it, experience, but it's refused to break a single component, and I don't think the parts in there, except maybe that graphics card, were marketed as being performance parts in their time anyway. That processor almost certainly wasn't. I'm sure you can imagine what it was like when I actually got the Pentium D Works to Hishan built. Coming from a 486 to this thing was just unbelievable. Uh, and obviously, finally, dual processor again. Single processor never felt right after that dual Pentium 3. It never did. Um, but last week, I had access to a Pentium 2. But I never used it that much, but even that was awesome after being stuck on the Puny 486 for so long. I mean, I, with the Pentium D, that was incredible. I could see what I was editing. I could listen to music. I could compose music. It was, it was unbelievable. But I've never forgotten this small little 486. I've, I've always remembered that it got me through some rough times, and whilst it might have been slow and unreliable due to mistakes I made and lack of funds and time to actually invest in the thing it would still tend to get there every time and I've never forgotten that anyway I hope you've enjoyed this video hopefully we can get Dark Forces done soon oh I've given it away now like it wasn't obvious already and if not why not and if you did why did you leave a comment press the like button subscribe if you want or don't it's entirely up to you i can't make you do anything unfortunately i wish i could it'd be brilliant i'd, I'd rule the world but now uh that aside i'm high treason and i'll see you again soon Really is stubborn this machine. <laughs> <laughs>
It's that white monitor there. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be starting now. At least the list's not getting uh, disc failures no more. I think it's camera shy, because uh, you see the menu there. We're going to start up now. The keyboard's not working this time. Well, now it was working when the monitor was fucked up. Which is what happens when you build a computer for the price of three cigarettes, a box of Richmond, and however long you want to spend in a bin that a million tramps have probably urinated in. It's, uh, yeah, actually maybe that's why the thing smells the way it does. Yeah, I never thought of that. It smells like public restroom, this machine. It's, uh, yeah, a bit strange. Try and get it fucking going.